girls, and welcome to another episode of the Hey Girl Podcast. We're your hosts, Bethany Needham and Laurie Casagrande. And each week, we get to share with you stories from women of all ages and stages of life who are following Jesus right where they're at. Our prayer is that each story encourages you to run your race in your place. Okay, ladies, we're still in our best of series. And y'all know I could not get through an entire best of series without bringing back one of my faves, Regina Robinson. Oh my goodness. Girls, if you have not already listened to Regina's episode, you absolutely need to hear this. Hers was one that immediately after releasing it, I got bombarded with messages of people who were just so blessed and encouraged. And honestly, we're probably fangirling as much as I do every time that I get to spend time with Regina. Regina and her husband are from the Boston area or currently serve in the Boston area. And man, is her story and the ministry that she has there just so incredibly powerful. So I'm so excited for this best of episode. Please enjoy my girl, Regina Robinson. I met my husband, Jua, um, at a Campus Crusade for Christ conference, um, and he fell in love with me. I kind of liked him, too. And, you know, through our courtship, uh, we were married about a year later. And while he was in graduate school, about two, three years in our marriage, God really started tugging on his heart about pastoring in regards to what it would look like to lead a, a group of people in closer relationship with each other and closer relationship to God. Having been a preacher's kid, I was kind of like, yeah, no. Thank you. Um, I, I wouldn't say that to him because you don't want to crush a brother's dreams, you know? And so I listened, um, I prayed with him, but having been a preacher's kid, still, you know, a preacher's kid, um, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. But following God's lead means following him in the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Um, so little did I know that um, going down that road of... Um, pastoring would lead us to church planting. So we moved to Little Rock, Arkansas for um, training at Fellowship Bible Church. We were there our first year in preparation for planting a church in Boston. While there, we had our baby girl, Jordan, who is now our 11-year-old. She's our oldest, and she's our chef, our, our just budding chef. It's really a blessing to have a chef in the family, I gotta say. And so she's How our oldest. How did you work that out? She, it was her, it was her it was her calling, her desires. Um, she loves um, the Southern cuisine of my side of the family, but she loves the kind of eclectic nature of my husband's side and loving all types of food. She wanted to create things in the kitchen. Who would say no to that? Seriously, can I adopt her? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Um, but you can come to her restaurant one day because she already has a business plan laid out. Perfect. Um, <laughs> she's Perfect. Amazing. She's a, she is really, um, when I was pregnant with her, I had girlfriends in Little Rock tell me that I was going to love having a daughter first. And they were right. She just having a, a, a girl who wants to learn the things that you've learned. Um, she's just been, she's been pretty amazing. And God knew what we needed because when we moved to Boston to start vision casting and developing community, um, found out I was pregnant uh, a few months after moving here. Um, so yay, moved to Boston. That was like my welcoming gift. Um, was getting pregnant, but um, you're where, welcome. <laughs> you're, <laughs> thank you, Boston. Um, <laughs> but but where you know the story really shifts is here. I am, um, you know, a woman who is on the trajectory of higher education, um, moving up the ladder in higher ed. Um, and, you know, moving towards the executive ranks to hopefully, you know, one day prayerfully lead a college. Um, so I've got the trajectory. I've given it to God, Jeremiah 29, 11. These are your plans, God. Um, and now I've married a man and we are planting a church in Boston and we're giving that to God as well. But upon moving to Boston, getting pregnant, February 13th, 2007 was the game changing day, um, because we went in for a routine ultrasound. Already having a child, having baby girl Jordan, you know what to expect. What we didn't expect was the doctor um, saying, oh, my God, something is wrong with your baby. 
Hmm. And that's where the life story shifted drastically. And, um, with, with no pay, no sense of patient centered care. Um, he just looks at the, you know, sonogram and he says, look, look at this picture here. This is your baby's brain. Um, he has a condition called hydrocephalus. Well, he didn't say he, he just said, you know, um, there's a condition called hydrocephalus, too much fluid on the brain. Uh, and I think you should terminate the pregnant immediately. And it was all in one sentence. That was kind of that day that you never expect to happen. Wow. Um, and, um, so then he said, let me get another opinion. He left the room and I got to be honest, a woman came in and I thought that woman to woman, you know, there would be a different level of care and emotion and sensitivity. Not at all. Not at all. She looked and said the same thing. Oh my God, something's wrong with your baby. You need to terminate the pregnancy. This is too much fluid, too early in gestation. You need to terminate. Um, And that was it. And then they left the room. Um, And before they left, my husband said, wait a minute, but we also came here to find out if we're having a boy or girl. And the the gentleman kind of just waved his hand and said, oh, it's a boy as he's walking out of the door. And that's when we realized what is what, what is changing, what is happening. That leads me to kind of why I'm where I am today, um, 10, 10 years into the journey of Boston, um, Josiah is his name. He is our 10 year old. He's rocking our world. The prenatal diagnosis was hydrocephalus. That's what they were preparing us for. I kind of became a neurologist overnight. You know how moms, you know, you find out information and then you research it to death yeah. and you become that unfortunate expert on all of the, the bad news. We entered into several months of encouragement to terminate the pregnancy. And again, I'm a preacher's kid, preacher's wife. And that was the, one of the darkest seasons of my life. I remember people asking, how can I pray for you? I said, you know what? Pray whatever God gives you. Um, I don't really know what to pray right now. All I've asked God to do is to help us just help us in whatever we're going to go through. But fast forward, there was a happy ending. Um, they uh, ran further tests that concluded he would have Down syndrome um, as well. And as one doctor said, followed by many other doctors, he is going to have a double whammy of negativity in his life. He is going to have a poor quality of life and you don't want that burden on your hands. Why would you not terminate? And I looked at one doctor and said, well, what if I just want to meet him? What if I just want to meet him? And then she looked at me and said, well, don't go hoping for some miracle. You need to make the best decision for your family. So fast forward, Josiah is born. The happy ending is a few days after he was born, neurologists kept kind of looking at him because he wasn't presenting like a kid with hydrocephalus. And they um, ran an MRI scan and the MRI scan concluded he did not have hydrocephalus. Wow. So that's a very short story that will hopefully become a book one day because there are so many details um, in the midst of it. Yes, he does have Down syndrome, but he is, you know, the happiest, kindest, highest EQ in his class, in his school. He's the mayor of his school. He just loves people. If you meet him, you will get a high five or a hug unless you're just not a nice person. And then he may call you out to dance but he's our number two (laughs) he's our number two he's our game changer um and he's the reason why god opened up a lot of doors for me to do some of the advocacy work that i'm doing now then number three is joy she's our spitfire she is a bundle of joy joy literally came in the morning after all of the weeping that you know we had to go through with josiah and joy has been a great sibling to him she is just a smart girl she's our stem girl She wants to be an engineer slash Boston police officer one day slash everything else that comes, you know, in her mind (laughs) Um, uh, week to week. Um, And then Jeremiah is our uh, bulldozer of emotions, of ideas and of verbal energy. He's five and he is um, a very loving but interesting character as well. And so that rounds out our J crew. And that's my story. (laughs) <laughs> wow so many parts of this let's go back a little bit because you said you're from the south 
Yep. You came up here to New England, to Boston. Tell me a little bit about, first of all, just the culture shock of that. (laughs) Oh, my. Oh, my. The first shock for me was the first day we returned our rental van. I was driving through one of just one of the main streets and the light turned green and I must not have moved fast enough. And I started getting honked from behind. And I just kind of, I just looked in my rearview mirror like, who's honking at me? The light is green. I'm easing off of the brake pedal. <laughs> this car swerved beside me and they just angrily looked at me like, you are wasting my life. <laughs> um, and I had my baby girl Jordan in the back seat, and I thought, what have I done? And then I thought to myself, my word, what have I gotten myself into? Am I not an effective driver? It made me question all of my life's decisions um, because my driving was ineffective. But 10 years later, sometimes I'm the one honking. So I've got it going on. I, I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm well adjusted. I was going to say, you mean you waited until the light turned green before you started hitting your gas pedal? I didn't realize that was a thing. That was Anticipation, my friend. Yes, anticipation. (laughs) People here have things to do and places to go and Mm -hmm. people to see. So drive. Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) move it, lady. (laughs) It was an, that was an interesting, you know, probably, you know, I'd say a superficial, you know, culture shock. But um, I wouldn't say that there were beyond just kind of adjusting to colder weather for a longer period of time, enjoying shoveling as a winter sport. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> uh, you know, I people are people and I learned to make great friends again because we entered very quickly within that first year a very tough and dark season god brought amazing girlfriends from everywhere from suburbs to downtown god really provided and so people are people women are women and caring for one another really does look the same when it's authentic amen so one of the things you mentioned when i heard you speak at lead youth was some of the shift in the different ethnic groups that we have here versus what you came from. Do you want to talk us through? I just, I found it fascinating for someone like, wow, I never, ever would have thought of that before. Yeah. So I, um, I had an aha moment within my first few weeks here. You know, I do believe that retail therapy does does amazing things for the heart and soul, especially when you are in new places. I just maybe that's superficial about me. I don't know. But I think we'll save that, that till the end. <laughs> I think that I can meet a like-minded girlfriend pretty much in any boutique, in any store. So I set off to find a TJ Maxx. First, I have to, I have to admit there's so many amazing factors of living in New England, but with any new territory, I I long to find something familiar just for a sense of comfort. So a few weeks after moving here, I realized I hadn't seen a lot of things that reminded me of home. And so I just said, you know what, Lord, could I find my four areas of comfort, Walmart, Target, Chick-fil-A and Cracker Barrel. (laughs) Yes. And I located them and I I Googled, I, I did a search, I found where they were and I made it my business within the month to go to those places just for a sense of familiarity. But I also needed to go to my local TJ Maxx because I just believe in retail therapy. And so I'm just kind of walking through the aisles, looking at whatever is on sale. And this woman walks towards me towards the same rack, cute dresses. She's a white woman. And I just immediately assumed I'm going to start up the conversation. I'm an extrovert. I like people. We'll talk about a cute dress on any given day. So I look at her and um, I said, this is such a cute dress. And she looks at me and she says, yes, it really is. But she said it with an accent. And I thought, that's amazing. Um, Where are you from? Um, And she said, you know, I'm from the Ukraine. And I thought, 
that's pretty awesome. I didn't, you know, want to ask too many details of now, wait a minute, where is it? And tell me more about it. And, you know, don't want to be that person that goes so deep on the, you know, on the first hello. I gotcha. It's just your first so, date. Just my first slow date. Your roll. Just, slow just, your roll. yes. S- slow down, Regina. Slow down. So we continue talking about um, the dress and it was cute. A few minutes later, I thought, you know, a black woman comes over to the same aisle. Apparently, I was at the aisle of the, the day um, because there were cute dresses. And she comes over and she's on her phone um, and she's speaking in another language. So when she gets off of the phone, I was like, this is such a cute dress. And she was like, yeah, super cute. So we started to talk. And again, I detected an accent and I said, um, you know, I'm new to the Boston area. So tell me where are you from? And she said, I'm from Haiti. And I thought, this is amazing. And when I left the store, I um, I got into my car and, you know, I was checking in with my mom. She was checking in with me. How are things going? And my conversation with her that day was, mom, I had an interesting aha moment. The white people aren't white and the black people aren't black. In the South, where I'm from, I met many African-Americans and many Caucasians. It was just kind of the categories that people were in. But within a few weeks here, it was crystal clear that it wasn't just black and white. There was just this beautiful, wide array of diversity and ethnicities. And I'm meeting people from countries from around the world and um, cities I never heard of. And I began friendships with so many different people that upon first glance, I would have assumed something different. And um, I was grateful for having a gift of diversity growing up, but this was another level of diversity that blew my mind. And it still does. I'm still fascinated with living here and the, the beauty among diversity. I just loved hearing you talk about that. And I think I just take it for granted living here. And I don't always... Um, consider the fact that we, it is kind of a gift to live in a place where there is so much diversity. It's so much more than just the black or white. And I think of my, my kids, the schools they go to and how my son, especially in his friend group, like he is the minority as the white boy in his, in his crew. And, but I love that. It's one of my favorite things about the place that we live. I I don't know why, but that story like forever sticks out in my brain of you sharing. And I was like, Oh my goodness, that's so true. It, I mean, I couldn't believe how much of a a shocker it was, you know, to me having experienced, you know, growing up as a preacher's kid, I've experienced you know, missionaries and, and had relationships with, with people from around the world. But it was very different, just the simple encounters of everyday life. Um, that for me was um, fascinating. It was exciting. Um, many of those first encounters became fast friends. And I also learned a uh, very interesting point from um, one of my first friends here uh, who would, when I, when I'd go out to different places with her, depending on where we went, people would engage me, you know, in, in, in Spanish or, you know, or in French. And she was a Haitian woman. And she said, Regina, just tell them you're just a black American. And I, was, <laughs> I didn't realize that that was a, just a thing that I'm just a black, like, when did I get reduced to just a black American? What does that mean? (laughs) But the way she explained it to me was people are so proud of their cultural heritage here. You have to clarify your cultural heritage or it will be assumed for you. That helped me understand the beauty and the pride of the diverse population that we were about to embark upon as church planners. Yeah. If you take the word just out, you can say that with so much like, I am a black American. Yes, I am. I and like, am. Then there's much, it say? sounds more proud than just, as soon as you add just, it's like, well, exactly. I'm, that's all I am. <laughs> and when she said that, I said, when did I get reduced yeah. to just a black American? Oh my goodness. I don't want to start singing, I'm, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, but my goodness gracious. It was, it was really an interesting phenomenon here. And I love it. I absolutely, my neighbors, everyone's from a different place in the world. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh yeah. So in all that you've walked through this journey that God has brought you on, um, you mentioned your son, even growing up as 
a black American. And we know, especially in recent days, obviously racial tension in our country and all of these things that are going on around you have really kind of taken this position as an advocate and doing a lot of work in that arena. Talk to us a little bit about what that looks like in your life. Cause that, that is one thing as you shared, that's, that's about the time it tipped the scales into me fangirling and just being like, man, I need to know this woman. Like I just so much respect and appreciation for the work that you're doing in Boston and beyond, but obviously located in Boston. Having had the parents that I've had, I'm really, really grateful for parents who are bridge builders. They believe strongly in that calling, understood it biblically, why it's important as believers to be bridge builders. I adopted that mindset, um, not realizing where it was going to take me. So it's one thing to have an upbringing. It's one thing to appreciate the principles that your parents teach you. And it's quite another to embark on a journey where it will be tested every step of the way, right? So um, I kind of believe in the ABCs of knowing yourself. Um, And for me, my ABCs are I'm an advocate, I'm a bridge builder, and I'm a communicator. And so whether it's with race um, and ethnicity or whether it's with ability and disability um, or whether it's with areas of spirituality, I want to be an advocate for who I'm representing and speak up for those who may not either be able to speak up for themselves or not yet at the table to speak up for themselves. But then I also know that as believers, I'm called to be a a bridge builder. Um, And so I I think about what is the bridge that is between us and how do we cross it to meet one another Mm -hmm. and hopefully to walk to that other side of understanding, of engagement, of awareness. That is not an easy road, as we obviously see um, in, in many of the, the current events and racial tensions that have been with us for a long time, but just have surfaced now in, in a different way. There has to be a level of awareness that it actually exists. I've learned that um, in the world of disability and ability. Uh, you'd, be, you'd be amazed, Bethany, to kind of see whether you're talking about race or whether you're talking about um, gender and helping men and women understand, and, uh, you know, appreciate and affirm each other, um, or whether you're talking about um, abilities and disabilities, uh, or whatever cultural differences you're talking about, it's got to start with awareness. Hmm. And if you're, if you're not aware, if you're not even paying attention, you're completely missing even the beginning stages of building bridges towards understanding oneness, caring communities. My father is a pastor of a predominantly black church, but we've also gone to schools where we were the minority and we were in predominantly white schools. So I came to understand both cultures very, very well. But the world of disability and ability is another level. It's just talk about not paying attention. You know, I've learned in this journey with Josiah, people with disabilities are another marginalized population, folks who sometimes get disregarded they're invisible. And then when you add the layer of race and ethnicity to people with disabilities, we could be here all night. I mean, (laughs) the disparities are real. The challenges are real. So I just believe that I'm called to be a bridge builder. I'm always wanting to find ways when I'm connecting in communities. So that's really the place I start. And I just think such a powerful part of your testimony, what God's done is that he has layered those things in your life that you, that you're not just speaking from this idea of what is it to face disability and um, race issues and all of these things. Like this is all under your roof. This is your life. Tell me right now in this season, what do those platforms look like for you and the places that God has given you to build bridges and to advocate for people? So the platform initially moving to Boston was I was going to be a pastor's wife. I was going to find my way in educational circles here because that was my trajectory. Having Josiah shifted it all. My heart needed to take a break from trying to plan a church. My heart did. My feet and my arms still went through the motions, but my heart was just struggling and what God did during that dark season of from February to July until Josiah was born, what he did was he brought about friends and girlfriends and even strangers who were moved by my experience. 
and by what I was going through. And they wanted to help come alongside. This is the beauty of community. You start to realize how important it is for you to find your people because when you're facing a decision of termination and you say no to Harvard medical doctors, you find out really quickly where you stand as you speak truth to power. So as you can probably tell, Bethany, and you probably could tell at the conference, I'm an extrovert. I love to talk. Um, <laughs> not just not just talk, talking. I know since I've known since I was a kid that I have a calling to speak. What it looks like for me now, it started as a pastor's wife. It started as you know a church planner. It started as being a mom of one, but then becoming a mom of two and needing to use my voice to advocate for a boy I'd never met. It took speaking to another level because now I'm speaking truth to power. Now I'm pushing back to power. No one tells you when and what to expect when you're expecting that you may have a doctor give you bad news and you're going to say, no, thank you. For me, it made me realize um, there's something to this. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of women who are faced with these decisions all the time. And how do they know what are their next steps? So advocacy began in wanting to get training on understanding medical practice, best practice, patient-centered care at hospitals, and that led to leadership roles to help advocate for parents in the city of Boston. I was trying to learn as much as I could to help survive my situation. One thing led to another. I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm advocating, I'm building my advocacy muscles, and I join a couple of local boards. I start volunteering in different ways. That led to speaking opportunities. That led to training opportunities of other families and parents and educators. And in 2014, somehow my name and the work that I was just doing on the local level reached Mayor Walsh, the newly elected at the time Mayor Walsh of Boston. And he um, called me and asked me to sit on a committee I thought it was a prank call because why would the mayor be calling me? Um, I was I was kind of ready for like Jimmy Fallon or someone to jump out in my bedroom and say, gotcha. Hey, that um, would not be that disappointing for Jimmy Fallon to jump I out. Know. <laughs> I was I was I thought, who am I being pranked by? Because how More like does Ashton the, Kutcher. Right? Oh, yes. I thought Ashton, somebody's going to like jump out and say you've been punked in that split second. I thought I was being pranked. And then I thought this could be that guy. And let me not say. Quit playing. Get off the phone. Who is this? I'm glad I didn't do that. <laughs> that would have been an incredible story, though. Yeah, yeah. I still tell him because he did call me while I was taking a nap. So I did think I was having an out of body experience. Um, so I told him, you know, he was a great wake up call, um, literally. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you know, he did. He appointed me to a committee and then that opened up the door to a school committee appointment in Boston. It's appointed, not elected. Um, and that was a huge step of faith for me. Can I do something like this? By this time, I'd gotten back into higher ed, dean of student affairs at a local college. And so my plate was full. But I knew that building those advocacy muscles were not in vain. And I knew that God was taking me to a place that I had not set out for on my own. But here I am finishing up my first term as a school committee member. And it's been a wild ride. Many highs and lows, but many opportunities to as the Bible says in Matthew, to let your light so shine. What I just love about that story is you were just walking what was in front of you. You were doing the research you needed to do to survive what was given to you. And just that imagery of you were being faithful with exactly what God put in front of you without necessarily having this huge vision of, well, maybe if I do this research, then eventually I could maybe the mayor will call me, wake me up from a nap and I'll end right, up on right. a school committee. Like you just kept walking and remaining faithful. And then God just kept showing up. I that's think it. that's incredible. You better preach it, girl. You said it better than I did. <laughs> no, I just, I'm sitting here like, wow, that shouldn't that be all of our stories? Like, yeah, but here's the thing though, Bethany, if God would have laid it out in front of me and said, so Regina, you're going to move to Boston. And instead of planting a church, um, and instead of just impacting medical students, I'm going to have you impact the medical doctors. Oh, and Regina, I'm going to have you impact some of the world's greatest physicians who do 
some of the most heinous things because of the things that they're telling women to do when they find out they're going to have a child with some level of disability. And you're going to speak truth to them and you're going to talk back to them the way you tried to talk back to your mom and dad and it didn't work out okay. (laughs) Gina, I'm actually going to let your talking back work out for you. Like if he would have laid all that out for me, oh, and you're going to have a boy and what they're telling you prenatally from the highest levels of leadership and the highest levels of expertise in the world. I wasn't going to see mom and pop doctors. I was seeing Harvard medical school professors. So like if God would have laid all that out, I would have still said no thank you because who wants to go through so many painful chat like one thing after another wait hydrocephalus okay i become a neurologist i've got to learn everything about my baby's brain because they told me he may die they told me he may not make it full term then they told me he may not live very long then they told me all of these you know instances and examples of poor quality of life so they give you this death sentence oh wait now he has another diagnosis of down syndrome one doctor was like you don't want that burden on your hands so if God would have told me, I would have, you know, who, who, who says yes, thank you to such hardship. And yet you're absolutely right, Bethany. He, he handed things to me that all I could do was say, we need your help here. My, my only, one of the only prayers I remember praying in the early months of 2007 was God, whatever you do, you got to just hold us up. You got to just help us out. I don't know if I'm going to be that mom that gives birth to a baby who's not living anymore because they told me he wouldn't make it full term. I don't know if I'm going to be that mom who has this baby born with hydrocephalus and down syndrome. I don't know if I'm going to be this. I don't, I don't know. All I know is I need your help because this isn't a part of the Jeremiah 29 11 that my Sunday school teacher taught me when I was a kid. This isn't a part of the plans that I had set. So God, yes, God guided us every, our footsteps, every step of the way. And He just, he knows so much more than we do. And he did. He held us up. My prayer was, let Josiah baffle the brilliant. Whatever, whatever you do in his life, just let him baffle the brilliant. Don't let them feel like they're right about everything, please. And he's been doing that. Oh, that reminds me so much of that passage in Corinthians where he said uh, he uses basically to make fools of the wise, like baffle the brilliant. I love that. So gosh, just so much going on, as you said, with the school committee and everything else, obviously a lot going on in your life, but I'm wondering for you just right now in this season, is there something that you feel like, you know what, right now, I feel like this is something I'm really doing well at. And then balance that out with, is there something right now that you feel like, you know what, in this season, this could definitely use work. Like it just keeps hitting the back burner. Oh man. Yeah. A ton on both. Well, a ton on the back burner, probably more than doing well. Having four kids, 11 and under requires so much energy, so much energy, so much engagement. If there's one thing that I think they would tell you because they've given me this feedback, we have feedback sessions in our house. And so I want, you know, our kids to, Oh yeah. I want them to, you know, tell me their highs and lows, tell me what they've been learning. I call it the four L's, what the learn, listen, let your light shine and lead your friends in making good choices. So those are the four L's that I tell them in order to succeed in school, you got to learn. I'm going to ask you questions about what you learn. You got to listen. I'm going to ask you who you listen to and what did you learn from how you listen? Um, you got to let your light shine. Because the Bible teaches us that your light of curiosity, your light, it's not just your light, it's your light of curiosity, your, your light of kindness from that book, Wonder. You know, how can you be kind? How can you choose to be kind? And then leading your friends and making good choices. How are you being a leader? So we give each other feedback on, on how we've seen each other listening and how we've seen each other, you know, let our light shine. And, and so my kids, I use that kind of as a rubric, you know, those four L's, right? As expectations, but also as goals in feedback sessions. So my daughters um, gave me this feedback a couple of days ago because of some of the homework assignments that they have. Jordan had to do, she's in middle school, and she has to write a report about um, someone who um, 
has been courageous. So she's telling me about the book report. She's telling me the criteria of the report. And I said, well, you should write about yourself. And I gave her examples of ways that she was courageous and sticking up for a friend who'd been bullied. And, you know, I'm, t- I'm giving her all these examples of ways that she's been courageous. And she looked at me. She said, Mom, I want to write about you. Oh. And I was like, wait, what? Hold on. <laughs> um, what? And she said, I want to write about Josiah's story. I want to write about um, when, when you had him and the doctors told you you shouldn't have him. And so she was like, so this is what I need to know. And she starts asking all of these questions, which I just gave you all the adult version. How do you drill down the adult version of doctors are telling you to terminate a pregnancy? So then she's asking, what does terminate a pregnancy mean? And I was like, oh God, um, okay, so how do we have this conversation about abortion and abortion from a medical doctor? Like what, Lord Jesus, help me. It was one of those Jesus take the will conversations, you know, (laughs) you steer it, Lord, you steer it in the direction you need to take it. But she wanted to understand what it meant to um, have a conviction of something you know to do in your heart and follow through with it. Hearing that from my kids and, and, and Joy was just listening along and I thought, okay, I need to make this for an 11 and an eight year old's ears to understand. But they were just listening along and in their minds, they can't imagine life without their brother, right? But I had to show them the statistics of, you know, over 60 percent of women in the United States make a decision to terminate a pregnancy when they hear a diagnosis of Down syndrome. I had to show them the statistics in Iceland. A hundred percent of women are terminating pregnancies when they get a diagnosis of Down syndrome. So if there's something that I think I'm doing well, that my kids have given me feedback is I'm helping them see the value of difference. I'm helping them see the value and the courage that sometimes you have to have to speak up for people who are different, who, whether it's different ethnicity, different life experience, different life season, or different ability. I would hope I, that's just recent feedback. So I think I'm doing okay in that category of um, helping, helping my kids value difference, help, helping them let their light shine their light of curiosity and kindness and acceptance and care. Now, the other area of um, what I'm not doing so well, this, you know, it won't, it won't make the highlight reel. It's probably the juggling. I find myself always wrestling with juggling the, the balls in the air and longing for, sometimes I long for a sickness to take a sick day so I can just kind of relax and get a way to get it together. And I've had to learn, especially in this last year or two, find a better pace of mm-hmm. taking care of myself so that I can be a, a better wife and mom and friend and sister and daughter and leader to others, um, but also so I could just be a better person to myself. So juggling is definitely the area that I think I'm constantly asking for wisdom and finding better ways to really juggle balance, whatever word you use, you know, trade-offs, um, choosing the trade-offs. That's something I'm constantly trying to work on. You got some suggestions, girl? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you figure that out, you should definitely write a book. <laughs> I think I avoid the word balance as though it is the plague, but I love the word rhythms. That has become really a a life lesson for me in that life, there are rhythms. And the thing about rhythms is we can't sprint all the time, but there are times in our life where we're in a sprint and for that to be okay. And the reason it's okay is because before the sprint, we had a rest and there's a rest ahead. Yes, (laughs) And so it kind of helps us, helps us kind of to ride those rhythms. And for me, the hardest thing is the slowdown rhythm. Like I love the hyperdrive, throw me in a Mm -hmm. sprint any day, but man, slow down. I, I get fidgety and I just like, I'm useless. Like I need to do something. Uh Uh Yeah. And I'm saying that from God having just very recently put me into a season of, Hey, guess what? It's slow down time. And I'm like, no, (laughs) (laughs) but in the midst of that, as I think about rhythms, I'd love to hear what are the things in the season of just full, you got the kids and everything going on. Where are those areas that you find you are just really drawing near to Jesus 
And then what are the areas that you find probably are the most distracting, like the things, and I'm sure busyness is probably the obvious answer, like for all of us, busyness can distract, but what does that just for you specifically, what does that look like? What helps me really, I, I say, see God in the little things before looking for him in these major mountaintop experiences. Having Josiah really caused me to stop and smell the roses, literally. Because if you or any of your listeners either have children or are friends with kids with Down syndrome, kids with Down syndrome love all of the little things of life. So you can think you're having a walk in the park and you know the destination, you know where you need to go. But my little boy will not just walk in the park, he will wander in the park because a flower caught his attention, a bird did, or a dog scared him and he's going in the opposite direction. Whatever pace you thought you were going to have, my boy will change the pace. Mm. And having been a college track athlete, when you started speaking of rhythms and slowing down, um, it reminded me of running that that race, running the 400, um, where there is a, a different level of speed at different times you know, when you're turning and or when you're coming down the, the, you know, the back end of the track, um, your pace is different. Your stride is different. If you're running an even longer race, you really have to pace yourself, right? So that you can last. And so having Josiah, because I'm like you, I know what it's like to be in hyperdrive. I love it. I thrive in it. Give it to me any day. Let's go. Let's go. And I've had to learn a different pace with him. I've had to literally learn to stop and pause and pace and reflect, regroup and start again and reset those expectations. Having to do that in my personal life has really forced me to look for it in my public life and Mm -hmm. and to seek it out. So the ways that God draws me near to him is in those little things in those little gratitude moments where I actually take the cue from an experience with Josiah and I thank God for it instead of just taking the cue and getting a little frustrated that once again, I have to push reset. Once again, I have to readjust. Once again, he may be shifting my plans. I get drawn to the Lord when I can have that moment where I say, okay, God, I get it. I see you in this. I see you in this. I see what you're trying to teach me. Or when he winks and says, Hey, Regina, I got you. I got you during those little, those hard moments, those doctor's appointments that I thought would go in one direction and it ended up going into another direction. And he's saying, I got you. So it's the little things that he's really drawn me closer to him. The areas of um, distraction. I think when I, I really do have to say some of the same things, when I get, when I get distracted by the other little things that are really trying to block my view from seeing God for who he really is when I have unmet expectations or when I'm faced with disappointment. Um, I was really grateful early in our journey with Josiah and even my parenting journey in general uh, of having older parent mentors and older women who talked about disappointment, talked about expectation, um, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your goals that you thought you were going to have, um, and then becoming a parent shifted it because of the needs of your children but what to do in the face of disappointment. So I have to say that I get distracted when I get bogged down by unmet expectations and disappointment. And I have to fight it. I have to fight it constantly because it will hit me when I least expect it. I can give you an example. Uh, Sometimes I unfortunately can get triggered early on, especially with Josiah um, at the playground where I'm just out for a beautiful day on the playground with my kids and he'll try to do something that he's not quite able to do. And I'll see another child younger than him who is able to do it. Hmm. And that disappointment starts to seep in, right? I've had to learn to really wrestle with those unexpected moments of disappointment and distraction that distract me from truly loving him for where he is, right? For the moments and not the milestones that I'm looking for him to achieve. Wow. I think that's such a good word across the board for parents. How often do we walk through things with our kids and we look at someone else's kids and we're like, 
what is wrong with my child? You're or, supposed to be doing that by now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or how come, you know, this kid is either super talented and I still don't know what you do. <laughs> or the kid that seems so naturally well behaved and, you know, your kid just always seems to find trouble or whatever. I just think the whole mom shame game oh, yeah. can be so easy to fall into. And whether it's being disappointed in our kid or whether it's ultimately like just being disappointed ourselves and feeling like, gosh, what are, what are we not doing that we should be doing? And it's such a good word to remember to love, love our kids where they're at and embrace and celebrate the developments and, and realize that here we are, we probably teach this message where we're like, not everyone's going to be good at everything, but then we're like, but I want you to be (laughs) Exactly. Right. Except my child, my child will be good at everything. Yeah. And you know what? You're right. The beauty of disability is it allowed me to see the reality of struggle. Mm. Um, It allowed me to see the reality of of the vast array of differences in abilities. So no two kids with Down syndrome are the same. No two kids on the autism spectrum are the same. No two typical black girls are the same. No two typical white boys are the same. God has made us all uniquely different. And we know this. We learn it um, as kids. We celebrate it and embrace it as kids. And then we become moms. And that truth goes out of the window when we start to look outside of ourselves and our own families. I had a mentor, Carolyn Wellen from Fellowship Little Rock. And I remembered having tea with her and and a few girlfriends. And she shared with us as wives to not get caught up in the sin of comparison and competition. And I never forgot that 10 years ago. She shared, ladies, don't get caught up in the sin of competition and comparison because they will steal your joy. They will steal the joy of care and support for what it is that God has given you and your charge to take care of. I haven't forgotten it because I see it seeping up all the time. You know, it it really did make so much more sense not having number one, but having number two child and seeing the vast differences of his abilities. What doctors said he wouldn't do. Man, when he started to do what the doctor said that he wouldn't do, I thought, oh, y'all can't tell him anything. Watch out, world. Here he comes. And I had to learn to celebrate all of those little moments and affirm him in those little moments. Because guess what? If you don't affirm your kids where they are, please don't expect the world to. Please don't expect other people to. It starts with us first. I can't believe that, I, you know, I've come to this point in my life where I would say I'm grateful for the hardships and I'm grateful for the challenges and I'm grateful for those dark periods when I was in the deep pit of despair. But, oh, my goodness, all the things that God has taught me through it, how I can look a woman in the eye who is raising a a child with special needs and say, you're a good mom and you're doing a good job right where you are. Celebrate the small moments or how I can look any mom or any woman in the eye and say, God made you the way you are rocket girlfriend because he has a plan. Preach, girl. (laughs) I'm going to unplug my microphone and let you roll. (laughs) I love it. Oh, gosh, so much good. I'm going to jump down to our last question. I'm going to talk about this is going to be a little whiplash, but we can't go without knowing what is the most superficial thing about you. So it's it's around food. It's around food. I'm a, I'm a Southern girl. I don't know if it's superficial, but um, I do believe that Chick-fil-A is a gift from God. I do. Amen. Um, Preach it. And I know all of the Chick-fil-A owners in a one hour radius of where I live because I believe that God has called me to bless them. <laughs> as they have with, blessed you. <laughs> as they have blessed me. Amen. Um, so I, I, I probably can be pretty um, superficial in thinking that It is um, a gift from God that should be given to as many cities and families as possible. But also, you know, I I don't I I don't know if this is bad or not, but, you know, I I still have come to believe that my mom's cooking and her recipes are um, just the best way to go. Like her sweet potato pie. There's just none like it. Um, 
and her macaroni and cheese is, I mean, mine is a close second, a very, very close second. Don't tell my older sisters. I do believe that I do cook it better than they do. I can be superficial about my food, my Southern food. Has your daughter tried the macaroni and cheese yet to make it? Yes. Yes, she has. And um, I'm, I'm still cultivating that skill in her. Um, she can, she made, she made her first um, apple pie for Thanksgiving and Joy made her first sweet potato pie, of course, with my guidance. But it had to be just so. I'm just, I don't know if I'm just a, I don't know if I'm just a snob about what I love. But if it's not just the way Grammy makes it, it's not going to work. <laughs> so please don't try to outshine your sweet potato pie over mine. Just don't even go there. After all this conversation, I need to come to your house and just eat. I'm just going to eat. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's going to be a good time. It's what good friends do. Yes. Yeah. Well, we are BFFs now, so. Yes, we are. <laughs> what do you like to cook? Wait a minute. What do you like to cook? Because you can't just come to my house empty handed. Oh, so what are you going to cook? That's so sweet that you think I cook. <laughs> What are you going to bring? You need to bring something. How do you, uh, okay. No, I, I can make some things. My daughter will tell you that I have a very special recipe for ramen noodles that, oh <laughs> that cannot word. be topped. Oh my word. Okay. You are special indeed. I can bake an apple pie. I do like a good apple pie. I can grill. That is actually, I yes. I don't know what to do with an oven, but if you give me a grill and some Amen. meat, I will, I'll grill it up for you. I could grill all day Amen. long. Amen. So. Okay. Okay. We are in business, Bethany. You bring the grilled food and I will bring the sweet potato pie sweet and potato the mac pie. and cheese. Oh, Regina, thank you so much. This has been just such a pleasure. If ladies want to reach out, give shout out, say, hey, what's the best way for them? Are you more of a Facebook girl, a Twitter, Instagram? Instagram and Facebook. So it's Regina Robinson. You'll you'll find me there. You'll see my mugshot or a picture of my family. I'm more conversive on those platforms. But gotcha. please connect and let's chat it up. Change the world together. I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much for allowing me to be on. Keep up your amazing work. I really hope you enjoyed that episode with our girl, Regina Robinson. I'm here with Lori and a couple of questions I have for you. First, what was kind of an aha moment for you? That moment where almost like the light bulb goes on and you're like, wow, I never thought of it that way before. I want to say mm, 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 to all that delicious talk that you had at the end about the <laughs> mac and cheese and Chick-fil-A and delicious Southern food, but really mm, 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 to the content, the nuggets of information that Regina shared about her story. It was so savory. And I feel like I just had a delicious meal of Hey Girl podcast. I love all your like super clever food analogy, terminology. <laughs> I'm not that clever, so, but amen to the food. We need to go to her house and eat, by the way. Absolutely. We should get that in the book. Seriously. So for aha moment, something that was ringing in my head was that quote in the hospital of don't expect a miracle. And how do you have realistic expectations and not get your hopes up for things that may or may not happen and just trust in God, but also balance that we do have a God that loves us and has a plan for us. And miracle might not be the typical kind of movie star word that you think from love stories or fairy tales, but to expect that if you follow him, good things will happen. Hmm. And I love that Regina kept her expectations in God, followed his plan, and it helped shape who she is today. I love, and I've heard it preached recently, that idea of putting our faith in God, not in the outcomes. It kind of gives freedom to how everything play out when our faith and trust is in God. Then really, it is a miracle. Like, it's an incredible miracle with her son being born. As I was listening back thinking, they initially told her or encouraged her to have an abortion based on 
the first diagnosis, right. which wasn't even true when he was born. And yes, he, Josiah was born with Down syndrome, but just her description of him and like right. what an incredible the mayor. kid. Yes, the mayor of his school. I love that. I love that. For me, the aha moments were the quotes that just kept, like they were on repeat in my brain after right. chatting with her. The first is I love her quote of talking about the value of difference and her commitment to teaching people the value of difference. And I love that. I love that on so many levels, not just in race and not just necessarily in all the things we talked about in the interview, but just as someone who speaks to young women and women and this entire podcast of, I feel like that is a message for us on Hey Girl is that we are all different. We're in different seasons. We're doing different things, but there's value in that. I loved that. That was an aha moment for me. And I think about how God looks at us from heaven and seeing all of our diversity and strengths and weaknesses and loves us no matter what. And if we can take a little bit of that into our communities and kind of follow Regina's lead to embrace it, how much good in the world could occur. Amen to that. And just it's God's creativity. Like, man, Mm -hmm. if we valued one another the way that God put, you know, value in us when he designed us exactly the way that we are, which is very different on purpose. It'd be a very boring world if we were all just this, I don't know, if we were all lorries, that'd be pretty, that'd be pretty spicy. But Uh, (laughs) be careful what you wish for. Like even Regina said, she would have said no thank you to God's plan if she had seen it ahead of time without seeing the outcome. And I think in terms of diversity, it can be uncomfortable And we can say, no, thank you. I just want to be with people that are like me and that I feel comfortable with. But once you get through it and learn from different perspectives and embrace the unique qualities in everyone, I think hindsight, you'll appreciate it a lot more. Yeah, for sure. It's like the verse in scripture, be uh, slow to speak and quick to listen. And man, if we applied that more often especially when we're faced with diversity that we either don't understand or maybe it's even diversity that we don't agree with. Maybe it's people's, their beliefs, their convictions that we're not in line with and not just walking away from that because it gets uncomfortable and we don't know what to say. (laughs) Maybe not knowing what to say is the exact right place to be, is to not say anything, (laughs) is to just listen. Don't say something for the sake of saying something. Take time and listen and just start being okay with being uncomfortable. We say being okay with not being okay a lot, but let's let's be okay with being uncomfortable. It's so funny that you said that because last night I was with a group of friends and one of them brought up that he doesn't believe in God at all. And he has this view of this afterlife that he explained. And I did not know the perfect thing to say. Scripture didn't hit my head. So I just kind of listened and nodded and kind of agreed to disagree, but didn't kind of bring up my faith at that point. And I kind of reflected on it like, oh, what could I have said? What might have compelled him to see a different perspective? But to your point, maybe that wasn't, it wasn't the right time. And I can plant the seed another time and kind of have those tough decisions discussions. It's uncomfortable, but we have to trust that God's in charge and he's the driver here. Amen. Jesus, take the wheel. Absolutely. So of this whole interview, did you have a zing moment? In New England, we would call it a zinga. Zinga. <laughs> yes. We don't need those R's. It's zinga. Uh, my zinga was when she was talking about the sin of jealousy and comparison and being at the park and wanting your child to be just like the other children. And I don't have children yet, but I can totally relate to that feeling of wanting to, you know, be able to compare yourself. And I think we've discussed a little bit how easy it is on social media or among your friend groups and just owning where you are having that confidence and not getting uh kind of satan in your ear telling you that you should be a different way or your child should be a different way and um that was my zinga for the episode (laughs) i love that so much (laughs) what was your zinga it was kind of over the course of her story and god just pouring conviction into my heart of this woman that is doing incredible things in so many areas. You know, Boston's 
public school committee, like, you know, dean at this college, all of these things is absolutely incredible. But she didn't go chasing any one of those things that the more that she spoke and the more I listened to her story and realizing that the the thing that stood out to me most was she was just faithful with what was right in front of her and that God was faithful in bringing things in their right time. And you mentioned it earlier. She said, like, if God had laid it all out, I would have been like, no way. But as someone who's in this season of wondering what the you know next thing is, I just really needed to hear, you know what? Stop worrying about what the next thing is and just be faithful with the thing I clearly put right in front of you. And that's enough for today. You don't have to figure out like next week or two weeks or next year or whatever it is or how this decision is going to impact in the the next 12 years of your life and as someone who now we do this podcast thing there is honestly this temptation you you start thinking in terms of is this building the right platform for me like is this connecting me to the right people and i man you want to talk about a zinger (laughs) like to the heart i was like god I'm, I was never responsible for building a platform and like, this is your platform. This is your message. I just need to stay faithful. As a side note, and this almost sounds like a teaser, I don't mean it to be, but since interviewing her and since releasing a lot of that, and you know this, I'm looking at you because you know this, the number of people now that have responded to even, hey, we're going to come on the podcast, I think our list of people just multiplied by an extraordinary amount when I stopped trying to so do exciting. Things. And the teaser part is I have names on our list now that were legitimately names that I'm like, we'll never get to have these people and talk to them, but wouldn't it be cool if and then within like 48 hours, the, it was just like, yeah, no, absolutely, let's set a date. So Man, that one straight to the heart. And I'm sure I'm positive I wasn't the only one because that's one of those things to just be present and faithful with what's right in front of us. Along those lines, she said that believers are called to be bridge builders. And I think Regina has done an incredible job of crossing the bridge when she's ready to. And to your point, not looking three bridges ahead and just being in that moment. Keep building those bridges, ladies and gentlemen. I say gentlemen, but mostly our Hey Girl audience. (laughs) There might be some gentlemen. Right, exactly. So, so many great nuggets. Really delicious episode. Thank you for sharing it with us. Absolutely. And as always, listeners, we just want to encourage you wherever you're at this day listening to this episode, whatever is right in front of you, we just want to keep cheering you on, run your race in your place and keep being awesome for Jesus. Bye, girls. Bye.